So in this video, I'm going to speak about Kant's moral philosophy. It's a rather common topic in philosophy videos and philosophy little articles, and everyone wants to rush immediately to the whole axe murderer thing and sensationalize it, but this isn't a cartoon philosophy channel. This is a real philosophy channel, and so what I'm going to offer you is what Kant really had to say about his moral philosophy with an eye to his reason behind it, which of course is very Kantian because for Kant everything is about reason. And if we want to understand what Kant is really getting at with moral philosophy, we need to first understand why he is wanting to do this. His basic assumption about all morality is that there is a moral law. He wrote that there are two things that fill the mind with ever new and increasing admiration and awe, the starry heavens above and the moral law within. For Kant, there were two great areas of philosophy and reality. The starry heavens above is, of course, his metaphor for the creation, the universe itself, and the moral law within that sense that we have as human beings that there is right and wrong. David Hume had said prior to Kant that we cannot explain morality through reason or through experience, that our moral sentiments, Hume said, just are there. We have within us that stirs the breast, was his metaphor, a sense of what is right? What is wrong? We are moved to have feelings for our fellow human beings. And so our sentiments, Hume said, are what motivate us to moral action. Now, Kant wouldn't be satisfied with that, but he does recognize what Hume is saying, that yes, there is something within us. The moral law is within us. It's not a matter of a rule book. There, it's not the Ten Commandments or the do's and don'ts of etiquette. There is a moral law, and we sense it. We live it inside of ourselves. And so everything that you think about in terms of Kant's moral philosophy, keep that in mind. It's a moral law that is within us. Now, that doesn't mean that it only exists within humanity, because, of course, anything that humanity is for Kant is a reflection of the transcendent reality of the universe, and it's the same with morality. So, he believes that there is a pure, practical ra rationality for a science of ethics, just like there's a pure, practical rationality for science and perception. So Kant says he believes that there are pure, rational, moral judgments that come from reason. Morality comes from reason, not from a goodness of our heart, not from a mere sentiment, not from some sort of commands from God or nature or anything. The morality that is, is the true morality of what is commanded by the rigor of reason. And how do we know what is proper? How do we know what is morally right and wrong? Well, we cannot say a law that is true for each and every instance but we can identify, he says, a basic axiom for moral behavior. The argument he gives makes sense. It's internally consistent. It's a little bit complicated, it's a little bit long and involved, but it makes a lot of sense. And when you follow the argument step by step, it does make sense, internal to his reasoning, why it's wrong to lie to the axe murderer that everyone wants to talk about. That's not saying Kant is correct, <laughs> but it is saying that he has a reason. And what is his reason? What is his train of thought? Well, it begins with the idea of the good will. Now, remember what I said that for Kant, we can't give moral laws as a list of do's and don'ts, but as a basic principle, an, an axiom that can be universal. What he finds as the ultimate principle of morality is nothing can possibly be conceived in the world that can be called good without qualification except a good will. Every other positive aspect of humanity can contribute to the good, but the only thing that can be truly, purely good is a good will. 
all of our other moral virtues like courage and moderation and perseverance and other qualities of a human psyche could be good or bad only if it is the will which makes them good or bad. It is the will which makes use of other virtues, and that constitutes the human character, the good will. Now, what does he mean by the good will? This is something that he doesn't entirely explain to everyone's satisfaction, but we can get a very good idea that by will, Kant means quite simply the desire and duty to do good, to be good. The good will is good not because of what it performs or creates, not by its aptness for the attainment of some proposed end, but simply by virtue of the volition that is the good in itself and considered by itself. So the will is one of these concepts of pure reason that Kant talks about. He mentions God and cosmos and substance and self as being concepts of pure reason. And this works also for the idea of human will. And when we look at other human beings, he says, when we look at evil people, he mentions villains here, the coldness of a villain that makes him so dangerous to us, that makes him abominable in our eyes, is because that villain lacks goodwill. It's not so much what he does that makes him a villain. It is that lack of goodwill. It is that evil will, perhaps that makes him so dangerous and abominable to our eyes. Kant here is influenced by Hume and also by Rousseau, the idea that our sense of what is morally good and morally evil comes from an inner knowing. We just know it, but we know it rationally. Everything about Kant is reason, reason, reason. It's not about emotion. It's not about a sentiment, as Hume and Rousseau would say but it is an inner knowingness still. Again, not about rules, not about obeying rules. But, Kant says, the first proposition of morality is always a matter of duty. Kant's morality is usually referred to as a deontological system, from the Greek word dion, which means duty. This is not in addition to, because it is in no way separate from, the concept of the good will, because we have, Kant says, a moral duty. We have many moral duties, which is fairly easy to understand when you think about specifics. We have a duty to preserve life, including our own life. Kant goes on at some length about how it is wrong to commit suicide because it is a duty to preserve your own life, no matter what the circumstances are in your life. The duty to preserve your life is more than any particular circumstances. And so this duty, this sense of duty, and this moral imperative of duty is at the heart and core of being moral. And will and duty are inseparable within Kant's system. Because when we go to the second proposition of morality that he talks about, is that an action done from duty derives its moral worth not from the purpose which is to be attained by it, but from the maxim by which it is determined, and therefore does not depend on the realization of the object of the action, but merely on the principle of volition by which the action has taken place, without regard to any object of desire. What he's saying there is that it's not okay to say, well, it turned out in the end. And it's not okay to say, well, you tried, but you failed, therefore you're still wrong. Kant then would have been much more aware than we are today of the tradition within Greek tragedy, such as Oedipus, where Oedipus didn't mean to kill his father, he didn't mean to marry his mother, but he's guilty because he did. And therefore he deserves to die because he did things. We would, of course, say today, well, but he didn't intend that. And so Kant is, in that respect, disagreeing with the Greek tragedy and its sense of morality is that the only thing that matters is how it came out. No, it's not about whether it worked or not. 
It's about what was the will and the volition that went into an act. And that's, of course, something that we naturally fall back on when we think about, when we defend ourselves in our own action. But, but my intention was, I wanted to do what was right. I tried to do what was right. And so the moral worth of an action is the intent, the will again. So we have the first proposition is duty. And the second proposition is that it is from the purpose behind an action that is related to its moral worth. Not whether it worked or not, what, not the consequences of things. That, of course, is in direct contradiction to the other great moral system of the last few centuries, utilitarianism, or also known as consequentialism, which, of course, as it says, looks only at what are the consequences of an action. They say it doesn't matter at all what you intended. It only matters what the consequences are. So his third proposition of morality, which is a consequence, he says, of the first two, is that duty is the necessity of acting from respect for the law. That would be the moral law, the universal moral law, not the laws of your country. What's key in that proposition is the word necessity. And Kant explains it's not about an inclination toward respect for the law. It's not about respecting respect for the law because I cannot have respect for something if it's just a kind of wishy-washy, yeah, I kind of like the idea of a moral law, and when I feel like it, uh, no, 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 necessity. This is, of course, very consistent with how Kant thinks about everything within his philosophy, necessity, rational necessity. So we know there's a moral law. We know we have a duty to the moral law. We know that the moral worth of any action derives from the purpose and principle of volition of actions, and our necessity of acting must be from respect for that moral law. Wrap all these things together, it becomes, for Kant, the categorical imperative. I am never to act otherwise than so that I could also will that my maxim should become a universal law. Internally consistent with what he's arguing here. If there is a universal moral law, and of course there is, that's his assumption, then I should act according to that moral law and not just act according to that moral law, respect the moral law in such a way that my will and my duty combine so that I will that my maxim is a universal law. Now, this looks a little bit like circular reasoning, but sometimes circular reasoning isn't a logical fallacy. It's because the concepts are connected with each other. The idea in Kant of a moral law and a sense of duty and a sense of will combine into the categorical imperative of always acting so that will and duty and universality are all one and the same. The main reason he's arguing this way is that he's wanting to get away from what he calls the hypothetical imperative. Now, we're very used to the hypothetical imperative, even if we're not really aware of how aware we are of the hypothetical imperative, because what the hypothetical imperative is, is the if-then statement. Well, if I can get away with it, I will break the rules. If there's no cops around, I'll do that. If there's no real punishment, I'll do that. It's a very human way of thinking. It's a very wrong way of human thinking. I mean, if, if morality has any teeth at all, it should be something that we follow. As Kant says, it should be something we respect. It is something that we should feel a duty for. It is something that our entire will should be behind following the moral law. Hypotheticals lack respect because it's making excuses, it's making uh, conditionals, it's trying to find a way around the moral law. It's not obeying the imperative. It's just saying, oh, I have an inclination to follow the law. My will kind of sometimes does what's morally right. No, Kant is calling your bluff on this. He's saying, look, if it's a universal moral law, then it universally applies. That's what universal means. And your will should follow the universal law always. 
No if then, always. And that is why Kant says it's a categorical imperative, not a hypothetical imperative. It's universal is what that's getting at. It's always true everywhere at all times. 2 plus 2 equals 4 is always true no matter what time you're at, no matter what place you're at. The moral law, if it's going to be a rule for choosing right and wrong action, has to be categorical and not hypothetical, not relative to circumstances, but universal. I, I guess if I'm sounding like I'm repeating myself, well, I kind of am because Kant is. But it makes sense because one of the things that Kant asks us to consider is, okay, so you're in a situation and you're tempted to lie. You could have some tangible gain in this situation if you lied instead of telling the truth. Well, the categorical imperative is, would that act that you are thinking of doing, would you be willing to will that that be the maxim for all circumstances at all times? A universal law. So you're going to say, well, okay, well, in this instance, I'm going to lie. Well, would you say that then lying would be something that could be a universal law? That everyone ought to lie? That everyone should always lie? And of course, if everyone is always lying, it's pretty easy to understand that that's not really a good situation. You know, the famous axe murderer example is about that. Someone wrote to Kant and said, hey, what about this circumstance? There's an axe murderer, and he's looking for your friend because he wants to kill your friend, and you know where your friend is. Do you have a duty to tell the axe murderer what you know of where your friend is? I mean, he, the axe murderer is asking very politely, do you know where your friend is? I would like to kill him. Please tell me where your friend is. Do you have a moral duty to not lie? And of course, you want to say, well, I mean, I'm going to lie to him, of course, because I don't want to see my friend murdered. Okay, then we should always lie. It's always okay to lie. Maybe it's always okay to lie if, I, if it's a friend involved. I mean, where does it end? How do we really deal with that? Of course, the axe murderer is violating the, <laughs> the, the, the universal law, too. I mean, the, you ask the axe murderer, okay, you want to kill somebody. Are you willing to say that you must kill someone is a universal law? Well, if it's a moral duty to kill other people, it's probably not going to be good for the species, is it? A lot of people are going to end up dead, if not everybody. It, it just doesn't seem like a good idea. We, of course, we want to object to this. We say, okay, no, wait a minute. It can't be that black and white. It can't be that harsh and, and extreme. And Kant isn't stupid. He's aware of this. And that's why he says, anticipating this objection, that why the categorical imperative is there is because of that sense of duty and also that sense of our duty to humanity in terms of treating them always as an end in themselves and never as a means. Let's talk about the first one first. Duty, of course, was a key component in getting to the categorical imperative and understanding our duty to be moral helps us to see why the hypothetical imperatives are wrong. We are being asked to act lovingly toward each other out of a sake of duty. If the only reason you are kind to other people is because you want to get something out of it, well, how is that moral? Again, going back to the idea of volition and the goodwill, the only thing that is purely good is the good will. And if you are acting kind to someone simply because you want something in return or because you want to be recognized as a kind person or some sort of heavenly reward or earthly reward, well, then that's not acting out of a sense of duty. If the will is moved simply for a sake of its self-centered gain, then that's not acting out of a sense of duty. That's really, anyone can see, whether you're Kantian or not, that that's not really being good. That's looking for your own advantage. It is a will, Kant says, that is moved to act on the basis of moral duty that is concerned to do what is right from the sole motive that it is the morally right action to perform. And again, if it's right, then it's right. If it's wrong, it's wrong. Two plus two equals four. 
It's not up for debate. It's not up for hypothetical situations. Well, 2 plus 2 will equal 5 on every third Tuesday. No. We are to act lovingly towards one another. We are supposed to be kind to one another out of a sense of moral duty. No exceptions. And of course, if you're only doing it for your own good, you're selfish. That's not being good. So the bottom line then is Kant is saying, in no uncertain terms, that unless you do go with the categorical imperative, you really don't have much basis for a moral law, and you have no basis for calling anything good. If all you do is say that acts of kindness and love are good because they're kind, but you're doing it for selfish reasons, then that's not what good means. That's, and that's not a sense of duty to the law. There are two possible objections to this, of course. One is, why isn't it the case that our duty is to other people? Uh, feminist virtue ethics says that. The duty that we have is to care for other people. It is the people as the target and the, and the focus and the end of our actions that is the sense of duty, not a sense of moral law. I must care for them. And that does sound a little cold. And feminist virtue ethics, in the modern sense, is thinking in terms of people and the loving feelings that we have for people. It's more Humean in that sense, this sentiment that we feel for other people. The other objection, of course, is as a lot of philosophers in the late 20th century have argued now, there is no pure sense of altruism, even acting in the moral duty that Kant is talking about, we're still doing it because we think it's right. And this is something that Kant really can't escape. He has an answer to the first objection, which I'll get to shortly, but he can't really escape this idea of, even if you say, I totally believe there's universal moral law, I totally agree that it is my duty to obey the moral law, to unite my will to that moral law and respect the moral law in the categorical imperative, you're still doing it because you think it's right to do. You are willing to do that. And that's not true altruism in a technical sense. The second addition that Kant makes to the categorical imperative to explain it is this. Act so that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in that of another, always as an end and never as a means only. The plain language version of this is don't use other people. Other people are their own ends. As in, slavery is wrong. Why? Because what you're doing is you are using another human being in order to gain something from them. And we all know about manipulating people, using other people, and we all have a strong internal sense that's wrong. And Kant is saying that, yeah, it is it's completely wrong. You should never use a person as a means to an end. Because human beings are moral agents. They have reason. They have a soul. They are human beings. So it's morally wrong to manipulate people to get something that you want. And back to the axe murderer example and lying, it's wrong to lie to people. Because when you're lying to someone, you are using a person as a means to your own end. You're being dishonest to that person to trick that person into believing something that is false and therefore getting them to do what you want rather than treating them as a rational human being who is a moral agent in and of themselves. Don't treat others as things is another way to think about this. You use a pen to write something. You use a computer to do something. You use a knife to cut. You don't use human beings as tools to an end. One objection to this is to think in terms of, well, when we go into a store and there's a clerk there, a cashier, are we just using the cashier? You know, I, I want to pay for my groceries and get out of here as soon as possible. Are you using that other person as a means to your own end? Kant says always as an end and never as a means only. He's not so head in the clouds that he doesn't understand that we have real life to deal with. It basically means don't just use that cashier as a means only recognize always that the cashier is a person, a human being who deserves your respect, who's a moral actor just like you are. So you're doing a transaction. Be kind. Be generous. That's your duty anyway, remember.
even in the most impersonal transactions where we're only really interested in, in completing the transaction, we should never be rude, we should never be manipulative, we should never try to, to cheat. And here Kant is also answering the feminist objection to the categorical imperative of duty. We do have a duty to other people, and that duty is to always treat them as an end in themselves and never as a means only. It's still not lovey-dovey, it's still not really caring for people in that sense, but you are acknowledging that you have a duty to other human beings. Obviously not every feminist is willing to say, yes, that's a complete answer to our objection and Kant is right and sorry for disturbing you. No, of course not. That's, that's not necessarily an adequate answer, but it is a partial answer and something to consider that Kantian morality does understand that the law of reason does mean that human beings are morally autonomous. They are moral legislators who are agents in and of themselves not to be used. Now, why all of this is so important for Kant is not some way to get into heaven or not some way to accomplish any other goal other than this sense of duty to the moral law is that Kant believes that we are moral legislators, we are moral agents in the universe, and that means we have autonomy, we have freedom, and we are most free and autonomous when we are acting in a sense of moral duty, and our will is united to the moral law. And this sounds a little weird to some people, and some people do object to this on good grounds. But what Kant is saying here is that what releases our freedom is when we act always according to the categorical imperative. That's what releases our freedom. And that may sound contradictory. How are we free when we are trapped in a sense of duty to follow the law? But it goes back to the old Stoic sense, Kant does, of you unite your will with how things are, and that's what makes you free, because if your will is contrary to how things are, then you're in conflict with reality, and that is clearly not going to end well. You're not going to win against reality, the Stoics said. And Kant, he's not a Stoic, but he kind of is having the same basic idea there, because he says the will is not merely subject to the law, but is subject to the law in such a way that it must be regarded also as legislating for itself, and only on this account as being subject to the law of which it can regard itself as the author. So what Kant is saying here is, again, you, I'll use the Stoic example here, of if you go along with the flow of things, then your will and energy is uniting with the flow, and that's making you more powerful. If you try to swim with the current, you go really fast, because your will and effort are adding to the flow of the current. It's actually an old Taoist example I'm giving you now. But if you try to swim against the current, your effort is going against the flow, and your efforts are being decreased. So the moral law is like the current of a river, and if you unite your will with the moral law, then you are contributing to the moral law. You can see yourself as the author of the moral law. And this isn't just a mental trick. When we act from duty and respect for the moral law, then we are fully existing as an autonomous being. We are uniting our will, our sense of duty, our reason, and whatever moral sentiments we have with reality as it is. And that makes us free. And in putting our energy into the moral law, we are adding to the moral law. We're strengthening it. We are making it more powerful and making us more powerful and all the people we affect more powerful. You're always expressing your will in one way or another. Well, what better way to express your will than in concert with the moral law? Unite your will and your duty to the respect for and following of the moral law, which is at the heart of everything that is, and you are releasing yourself. That's freedom. And you are a part of causality, not just a victim of it. And it's this notion that Kant is giving here that Hegel took and really ran with it in weird ways, but that, of course, is for another lecture. But that's why 
you don't lie to the axe murderer. It's not just some sort of silly little parlor trick or game. You can still disagree with it. There's still a lot of moral suspect things about not lying to the axe murderer to save your friend, but there's a reason for it. And that's the thing about philosophy is always understand what the reasons are behind an idea. And then you find that it's not so simple. 